plays and gentlemen that the jury has reached a verdict uh, in this case. Let me just, and this is not addressed to any particular individual, but it's to everybody involved. We've got people on both sides that care about the verdict. Um, some of you wanted one way, some of you wanted another. I have no idea what the verdict is. I will not know until the jury comes in. If the verdict is what you want, what you are hoping for, no celebration is permitted. Okay? Uh, it's not a sporting event, it's a solemn event. And I uh, don't want any celebration or hooting or hollowing or clapping or anything like that. It's just not the appropriate time or place. Okay? If the verdict is not what any side hoped for, again, uh, if you cannot handle that emotionally, I'll ask you to step outside the courtroom and get the verdict from a friend or companion. Okay? Um, no crying or uh, gnashing of teeth or anything like that will be permitted. And if any of that begins, you'll be asked to leave by one of the officers. Okay? Um, I want everybody to be aware of that, handle that with the appropriate amount of respect for the work the jury has done this week and the work they have done today during their deliberations. So I will ask all of you to honor that request and um, again, contain your emotions for after the jury is released and we will receive the verdict here momentarily. All right, the time now is 3.53 p.m. And if there's nothing else to take up, we'll bring in the jury. All right, we are waiting for the jury to come in. Michael, let me ask you, what is it like as an attorney waiting with a criminal defendant for a verdict? Horrible, especially when you know your client is going to get convicted because you're going to be on camera standing next to somebody who's convicted and all that people are going to see is a loss, right? It's horrible. It's terrible. Uh, uh, it's nerve-wracking. It's obviously more nerve-wracking when the, when the outcome is in doubt. But in this situation, her attorneys, they know their jury. They live in Tennessee. They live next to these people. They know what the verdict is going to be. So this is maybe a little bit less nerve-wracking for that in that regard, but it's still very nerve-wracking. And you sympathize with a person after a while, uh, even after the heinous crimes, and then you know that they're going to go through one door and you go through another door. Uh, when I was a young attorney getting trained, they told me, listen, don't get too attached to your client because you go to lunch after after you lose. Your client doesn't. All right, you may be seated. All right, back to court. <clears throat> All right, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Briggs, fourth person, it's my understanding that you've reached a verdict. Yes, ma'am. I'll ask you to pass the verdict forms to Mr. Clark so I can review those. Mr. Gregg, as to count one in this case for the offense of first degree murder by premeditation, I will ask you, did the jury find the defendant guilty or not guilty of the offense as indicted? We, the jury, found her guilty, Your Honor. Of first degree murder with premeditation? Yes, ma'am. And did the jury set a fine? $50,000. Thank you, sir. I will ask, so say you all. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. some notches, I guess. All right. The jury for the offense of first degree murder during the commission of a felony. How did the jury find the defendant? We found her guilty, Your Honor. And did the jury set a fine? $50,000. Thank you. So say you all. Yes, Mr. Yes, Your Honor. Four person of the jury for especially aggravated burglary. How did the jury find the defendant? We found her guilty, Your Honor. And 
that the jury set a fine? $25,000. You may be seated. Thank you. Um, so, so you all, this yes. is count three. You may be seated this um, uh, Just a moment, we'll set the Senate for hearing and some dates for that. Um, let me just express um, my personal gratitude for the six long days of work that all of you and the alternates that were excused have put into this case. Um, I think both Mr. Sprill and General Brooks in their closing said this is not an easy case. <coughs> and that is, that is absolutely correct. A 160 exhibit case, um, give or take one or two, is never uh, an easy case to talk about, think about, listen to, and, and reach a conclusion on. Uh, your hard work and your attention, this has been a very attentive jury. I've watched you and, and I am very respectful of how much uh, respect you gave to the evidence that was presented as the attorneys worked very hard on both sides for this case. The court staff and the, uh, the clerk's office, Ms. Downs, her staff, I hope you find you were treated well by them. They are excellent in how they treat our jurors and, and appreciate your work as citizens. I sincerely hope that all of you found the experience, albeit difficult, a rewarding one. I hope you see the importance of serving on a jury and why it is so critical that we do take the time to serve in this capacity and judge each other to so all of you um, I will commend both prosecution and defense you, it is rare that you will see a trial that proceeds as a well-oiled machine as this one has. Both sides were very well prepared. You have very skilled attorneys, very experienced attorneys. So this case was well presented on those sides. And I commend both for, for the work. And you, you've had a, a pleasure in seeing when the case goes right. Uh, maybe not the verdict as, as far as both sides. It, it, can't be, it can't be good for both sides, but uh, it was well presented and um, you, just, you just don't sometimes see it. <coughs> I hope you appreciate the work that went into it. It's like, I guess, the Super Bowl where sometimes those catches look easy, but what was done here today takes a lot of experience, training, and preparation. So, let me thank you yet again, and I'm going to excuse you for jury service through the rest of the month. That doesn't sound like a lot, but keep in mind that we have another two-week murder trial starting Tuesday a week from tomorrow. So uh, I will excuse you from that trial. I think you've worked hard enough, and, and this is an emotionally taxing type of case. The next time that you will call back will be March the 4th. That will be for a trial with Judge Street on, is that right, March 5th? March 6th and 7th, I think. Uh, I think March 5th is an election day, so two first Tuesday. Let me just double check. 6th and 7th. That's right, 6th and 7th. Yeah, you will call in after 5 o'clock on the 4th to know if you come in on 6th and or 7th. That will be with Judge Street. Should be in this courtroom as well. Okay? So I will excuse you for the rest of the trials for this month. Um, may not sound like a lot, but it really truly is. So, okay, uh, the trials we have uh, the rest of this month are, are quite serious and will be lengthy as this one was. So I thank you all for your jury service. I hope that you, um, again, were rewarded by the experience. And if you have any problems, need any excuses, have anything that you um, need to check with the clerk's office, Ms. Downs and her able staff will assist you with that as well. Uh, you can leave your jury badges uh, or the exhibits all back in the jury room and the jury instructions are all back in the jury room. Okay, nobody took any exhibits. We've got to have all those in the record. All right, um, your notes, you can leave back there. They will be shredded. And when we look at those, they will be shredded. You do not have to discuss your verdict with anyone, okay? Um, lawyers will sometimes call you. I've done it as an attorney in trying jury trials. I've called jurors up and said, hey, I you know, would like to know what I did right or what I did wrong or what you 
what you found important. Uh, lawyers may do that. Again, you've got very experienced lawyers. They, they may not. Sometimes younger lawyers will. Um, not that you're not young. <laughs> but uh, lawyers with less experience, okay? Um, but you, you may get a call. Um, if anyone else calls you or asks about your verdict, you are not required to discuss it with anyone. You're not required to discuss it with the attorneys, but sometimes uh, comments from a juror is the most helpful comments that an attorney can hear. Uh, you don't have to explain it to anybody, uh, and I will ask you to be respectful of what your other jurors discussed in the sanctity of that jury room, okay? All right, any questions from any jurors? I cannot thank you enough. Um, our able bailiffs here will escort you out. All rise for the jury, you are released from your jury supply. Thank you again very much. top of the hour we killed the break so that we could stay with this Michael Ayala joining me here now I want to talk about how she's re um, oh nope back to the judge maybe for sentencing info um, other state or defense wish to look part of forms they are signed by the four person of the jury indicted um, we would waive that all right we um, are all well aware of the Sentence, since this was not asked for life without parole or the death penalty, there's only one possible sentence for counts one and two. But I assume you would want a sentencing hearing or let's set, let's set a date so we can come back because I imagine there'll be victim impact yeah. that you would want to present. Absolutely. <clears throat> if, do we need a report, SDR? SDR. I, there's no, there's no prior record. I, mean, I think you have to. Don't, don't you have to? <laughs> even if, even if it is just a um, life, life with the possibility of parole, is the only possible sentence for counts one and counts two, which of course will merge. Um, that's not the case in count three and consecutive versus concurrent sentencing. I guess would be an issue. All right. Um, I will order a um, SDR with the risk and needs assessment. Um, as you know, Mr. Sproul, Ms. Ganger, there will be a questionnaire to fill out. Um, if she does not want to fill it out, I don't hold that against anyone as far as their uh, perception of the event. She has testified under oath that's sufficient for court. Uh, <coughs> besides Florida and New Jersey and Tennessee. Gosh, excuse me. No, you're on. <coughs> Florida, New Jersey, wow. and Tennessee. That's correct. All right. The, um, I'll wait on the date. We'll set a date for sentencing. Um, with being out of state, they'll have to check those records even if she doesn't have any prior convictions. So it may take longer than 45 days to do that. Do you wait that? Yes, Your Honor. How long does the state and defense need for work? It'll take, it, I'm sure, at least 60 days to get the report and risk and needs assessment. <coughs> Quite a few motions set on May 29. <coughs> I have May 1st, or we could set it on a violation day that we could set in the afternoon. I'm over May 1st, you said the 29th. May 29th, we've got quite a few motions on serious cases here. Um, we are starting a trial the afternoon of May 1st. Uh, we have jury selection on the evening of trial at 1.30 on May 1st. Mm -hmm. So the May 1st. I'm sorry.
of jury selection on May 2nd. Jeffrey Newman is up for talking about. Mm -hmm. I had my calendar at 1 30. I'll show jury selection 1 30 on May 2nd, is what the clerk showed. And that's what I'll show yeah. because we have so a new jury for jury on the 1st. Richard Yokely is. Yes, that, does that drag raise any vehicular assault case with Mr. Bates? That's for plea and sentencing. Yeah, we have a new jury for injury that day. So we went to the We'll be getting started late that day. That is a new jury coming in that day. But we could set this while it was at 1.30. On May 1. That will give the Department of Corrections February, March, and April to get there. Is Mr. Sproul coming back in? I don't, I'm not sure, but I have his calendar pulled up and that, that works for his calendar as well as my May 1st will work. And is that at 9 o'clock? Uh, let's set it at 1.30. I have a new jury orientation at 1.30 and we have a grand jury back there. But I'll show jury selection the next day at 1.30. All right, the sentencing that would be on the issue, uh, clearly count one and count two were merged, but count three, um, consecutive versus concurrent, and the number of years is appropriate would be an issue, so we will set that. Mr. Sproul, we're looking at May 1st at 1.30. Your partner says that that is good with your calendar. So guilty of all three charges, the first degree murder premeditated, guilty $50,000 fine. First degree murder commission of a felony, guilty $50,000 fine. And then the felony burglary, guilty $25,000 fine. And the judge was explaining those first two counts is automatic life with possibility of parole. The third count, the third conviction rather, will be uh, determined the number of years as well as whether it'll be consecutive or concurrent. Therefore, 
There's a sentencing hearing on that conviction scheduled for May 1st at 1.30 p.m., as well as scheduled for a motion for a new trial as announced by the defense. All right, I am so happy to have with me Michael Ayala. <laughs> it's good to, to see here. you. It was a different mm -hmm. kind of switch today. Tell me your reaction yeah. to the three guilty verdicts. Yeah, I mean, it didn't come as a surprise to me. I mean, I was really taken by the closing argument by the prosecution. Uh, also, their rebuttal argument, they made some points that really resonated with me. I thought it was a mistake by the defense not to bring in their own expert. Mm -hmm. They kind of relied on the uh, observations of other people, the victim's son, other police officers, the taxi driver, people who came in contact with her to suggest there was some kind of mental defect or problem or diminished capacity, but they didn't bring in their own expert. I think that was problematic. And they may not have done it, Michael, because they may not have had one. Yes. Typically, we know that's why they don't bring mm -hmm. one to the table. There's not one that's going to be favorable for their case. I think someone described it as a Hail Mary. I think yes. that it was a Hail Mary. I'm not surprised it was not successful and that there's a conviction on all three of these yeah. charges. We do need to squeeze in a break. Of course, when we come back, we're going to have much more on the Harvey verdict and reaction to the guilty verdicts. An innocent child and an unthinkable tragedy. Five-year-old Harmony Montgomery disappeared in 2019. You just need to find out which is. I have nothing to say. Now her own father stands trial for her brutal murder. I did not kill my daughter Harmony, and I look forward to my upcoming trial. So many questions that come back to the same question. How could this happen? The murder of Harmony Montgomery trial. Live coverage today, only on Court TV. to count one in this case for the offense of first degree murder by premeditation. I will ask you, did the jury find the defendant guilty or not guilty of the offense as indicted? We, the jury, found her guilty, Your Honor. Of first degree murder with premeditation? Yes, ma'am. And did the jury set a fine? $50,000. Well, as you heard there, a jury has just found defendant Annette Harvey guilty of murdering her longtime friend Robin Leonard. They deliberated for three hours and two minutes before finding Harvey guilty on all charges. Her sentencing is now scheduled for May 1st. That's right. Still with us, criminal defense attorney Marie Pereira, trial attorney Michael Jaffer. Michael, I have to bring you in first because you were insistent. You said, I know based on my experience that in the state of Tennessee, diminished capacity is not going to work. And you were dead on right. Uh, robots and computers on a jury almost always reach a different conclusion than human beings. When I was getting oriented fresh out of law school as a public defender, my, my mentor was, who's now a judge, was a grizzled attorney with white hair who was taking me through the prison system and introducing me to the clients that I'd be representing. And then I would meet a bunch of people. And then I was fresh out of law school. So I had all the theory in my head. Hey, this person has schizophrenia. This person my has bipolar job. schizophrenia. This person has paranoid delusions. Why wasn't this brought up as a defense? You told me, young man, everyone in this jail has schizophrenia and has something off. You don't end up here unless there's something off. His point was that as a society, our jury pool just has just abandoned any type of notion of a diminished. I don't agree with it. Uh, and that's just how we treat people with uh, uh, mental health issues. It's, mm. it's sad, but that's just the way it is. And so um, these defenses almost never work unless you're, you know, Portland or Seattle or whatever. Interesting. Marie, it's interesting because we've talked about this case quite a bit, and I know you had um, thought that perhaps they had made a pretty good case for diminished capacity, and that's not to say they haven't, because I think Michael Jaffer's point is well taken. The way the system treats with and works with mental health issues has always been problematic, and also, she never really went to get help after 2010. That could be for a lot of reasons. Mm -hmm. She could not have money. She could have not those problems as well. But Maria, I have a question for you, I promise. But my understanding is now that we're going to a press conference. Uh, and this is oh. Alex Leonard. He is the son of the victim. Let's go out. It was a kid's moment waiting for the verdict to come out. But when it came out, obviously it's what you all wanted. Do you feel like justice has been served for today? Absolutely, and we want to thank the DA's office for their really hard work on behalf of our sister so that she could have justice. It will never bring her back. It will never make it okay. But we realize the hard work of everyone involved, and I know that she's grateful for that, too. 
and we're sorry. Go ahead. Sorry. We're most grateful that our sister will never die because her students live on, and they'll make more students. And their people here today, they're changed. They'll change the world. Sorry, I didn't mean to. No. Um, I mean, talk about the strength that's taken for the past five days. It's like you kind of. Does anybody else want to answer that? Do you want me to do it? The f I, tr I really am trying not to cry. Yeah, you're, yeah. The fact that Robin fought for her life during those times to say that Annette Harvey did this to me, and the fact that she couldn't breathe, she had a collapsed lung, she just kept going and going and pushing through. She always took care of us when we were little. It was like we had to we had to stand up for her no matter what. It wasn't hard. It was a passion of love for our sister. And the fact that even in death, when they took intubated like extubated her, she kept fighting. Yeah, and then, I mean, you all are wearing purple too to support her, right? Mm -hmm. I've worn black because for me this is mourning. And I've mourned every day I've come to this place. Yeah, good. Thank you. Thank you so much. And those were the sisters, Michael, we were just yeah, discussing. the sisters and the son, right? The sisters and the son of the victims. Yeah. And I think how telling she wore black every single day because it's mourning. Even if there's justice, it doesn't mean you don't mourn the loss of that victim. And made a point about the heroic nature of the victim in this case, fighting yeah. back, but also even with a collapsed lung, making sure she had that on that call saying it was Annette Harvey that did it. Let me bring back in our guests here again. We still have Marie Panetta and trial attorney Michael Jaffer. Marie, I'll get back to you. Just want to get your reaction to it at the end of the day um, they didn't buy the idea of these paranoid delusions of the defendant I'm really shocked and I respect the verdict because the jurors have spoken but I don't think justice was done here I think the jurors what they did is they nullified the law because if they applied the intent portion of the uh, crime there was no intent here and she wasn't pretending the evidence showed that she had a mental break she had paranoid delusions from before this happened so the evidence was there and I agree with you Michael a thousand percent perhaps if her attorney he had brought in an expert to explain it. Maybe the jurors could have understand. Maybe that jury and that venue, that part of the country, they don't have an understanding of mental health. But she had diminished mental capacity in the testimony of everyone, including some of the prosecutorial witnesses who knew her from back in the day, knew that she was loco loco. And that they, they just rejected it, and I don't understand, except maybe from ignorance. But I don't think justice was completely obtained. I know the family feels better about it, but the jurors, they just disregarded it the intent portion and they nullified it and that's not justice in my opinion. You know Marie, I respect what you're saying about the evidence around diminished capacity that was presented but on the other hand you made a really good point during the trial. There were a lot of details in her behavior that made it question in my mm -hmm. mind was it really diminished capacity because for instance when she told the police what happened she quickly on the spot came up with an entire different story so I think maybe the jury determined they didn't believe her diminished capacity because there was not an expert. All right, hold it there because we can talk more about that and get your pushback, but we want to go back in. Now we understand the state. The prosecutors are speaking to the press. Let's go back. I, I, I simply feel relief that the victim's family was able to feel they get justice from this verdict because it, it was a difficult case uh, because of the mental health aspect of it. I, I would like to think that was a, a normal routine in my work, but a lot of times you, you, you don't get that with uh, victims' families or the victims. Uh, these are good people. They didn't deserve to be in this uh, type of forum. They're, they're totally unlike what we normally um, deal with in this job. And uh, Robin Leonard was not anywhere near what we normally deal with with this job. She didn't deserve to be the subject of a homicide investigation. Talk, sorry. Uh, talk about the amount of time that it took for the jury to come to a verdict. I mean, about three hours, I, I guess, we waited for. What do you think that says about this case? Well, I think they, they very carefully um, went through the 
the materials. Um, the, the two degree, the, the two, the two versions of first degree murder are very different legally. So, um, you know, I, I can only speculate to how long they spent on each one of them, but. Um, those are weighty issues. We had over 150 exhibits in the, in the case, so there's a lot to go over, but I, I try to try my cases in a way where juries are absorbing the information as we're going so they don't have to spend a whole lot of time uh, back there. Yeah, it was important from the first day when, you know, I, I watched the news reports and the students of Robin Leonard talk about the, the loss and, you know, that, that touched me and affected me and, um, you know, I've worked for three years to get here, so, you know, it's it's a relief. Thank you. Thank you. Well, hopefully we'll get before you. All right, so that's Prosecutor Dennis Brooks, and, and, and you know, there's no joy yeah. in getting a conviction here, making the point that he's glad for the family, they were able to get some justice, and that the victim didn't deserve this. That's absolutely true. I just want to comment on the, um, the, the premeditation of this. Mm -hmm. Something interesting that was said by the prosecutor in their rebuttal close mm -hmm. said she brought a knife to this interaction. And it doesn't take more than her decision to pull the knife out, open it, and begin stabbing to form the intent. Mm -hmm. And I thought that that really resonated with me. I hadn't thought of it that way. Um, and when you think of it that way, she also said she showed no remorse. She didn't even want to characterize this woman as her friend when it was clearly someone she had known for a long time and was friendly with. Yeah. So I think those, th those things help this jury a lot. I think so, too, and I think it makes the point, too. Closing arguments are significant. Don't no ever doubt. undervalue the significance in a importance of a good closing argument. I must say, too, that, you know, the prosecutor just looks sad. He's worked yeah. on this for three yeah. years, and the mental health aspect, as he said, is unusual. This isn't the normal case, and it's, it's sad it's at sad. the end of All the day. Around. That's the only yeah. way you can describe it.